Um, I'd like to greet you guys all with a uh, uh, pastor's verse of encouragement. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. James chapter two, chapter one, verses two and three. Um, at this point, I'd like to call Marv up for singing. Good morning. I hope everyone had a good week and is excited to be here. And uh, let's uh, start this morning by worshiping uh, God through song. Um, number two, how great thou art. And the little uh, verse underneath there is, is found in uh, Psalms 48 verses 1 and it says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And so let's make sure we praise him for what we have done or what he has done. Number two.
our second number, let's turn to 432. For those of you that are able, would you please stand? Softly and tenderly, 432. Okay, if you'd uh, open up your bulletins uh, to this week at CFC, um, ladies choir practice is on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. All ladies are welcome. Youth is on Thursday uh, at 7 p.m. We'll be having a cookie drive. Um, so if you know of someone that's in need of some cookies and some fellowship and seeing the youth, um, we'll be dropping off some cookies. So uh, talk to one of the youth leaders uh, for if you have someone that could use some cookies or if you want some. Um, Mum's Morning is on Friday at January 28th at uh, 9.30 and um, Men's Night Out is uh, January 28th at 7.30 p.m. Please check your mailboxes, uh, donation receipts are in there and a reminder to all the committee chairpersons, um, we will be creating a report book again for the annual February membership meeting. Uh, please send in your reports to Pastor Jake by February 6th and that membership meeting will be February 26th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, prayer requests, uh, pray for Alexander Brandt as he prepares next Sunday's message, and also pray for our fellow believers in the villages of Mibu and Tibu of Papua New Guinea. Um, also this week, there was more news of gang violence in another location where missionaries have been working for 13 years. Pray for the Mezzi Church and the, 
and these distant villages where attacks have taken place. Uh, also continue to pray for our seniors who find it difficult to get out, uh, get out much in the cold and snowy weather. And uh, let's praise God for our deacons uh, who serve in so many ways in financial stewardship of the church, support to the pastors, giving direction on projects and many things behind the scenes. Uh, missionaries to pray for this week are uh, Megan Friesen and they're from the YFC at St. Pierre. Uh, if you turn to the back of your bulletins, um, there's a family setting, sledding day. Um, Peter's going to come up after prayer and he will be elaborating on that some more. Um, mission report uh, is coming up from uh, Abe and Mary Harder uh, from Bolivia and uh, they will be in Manitoba in February and will be available for us on February 17th at 7.30 p.m. More details to follow. And uh, yeah, just a reminder, the membership meeting coming up February 26th. Um, oh, I also missed one other prayer request. Uh, Ron Drieger, uh, his brother-in-law, um, Ben P uh, Clausen, passed away. So uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, God, for all that you have blessed us with. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your care. And we thank you for your love. God, we just pray as, uh, as we uh, head out um, into the world this next week, Lord, that we can be a light to the world, Lord, that we can share your word, that we can be a testimony to others. We pray, Lord, that you will lead us and guide us and help us, Father, so that we can, uh, that we can be that light in someone's life. And uh, Lord, we just pray for um, Alexander Brandt as he is preparing for next week's message, that you will uh, help him so that he can... Um, be open to your spirit's leading and uh, and Lord we just also pray um, for the people of Papua New Guinea who have been uh, who have been encountering lots of hardship uh, Lord we just pray that you will be with them help them so that they can uh, feel your peace Lord and we just pray that uh, peace can um, can return to to their area Lord that they can um, that they can once again feel safe in their communities and uh Lord, we just also pray for the seniors uh, who don't get out much this time of year. Lord, we just pray that uh, you will uh, grant them joy and help them, Lord, so that they can um, still see your greatness. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you will also be with um, Ron Drieger's, uh, Ron Drieger, is, his brother-in-law has passed away, and just pray that you will comfort him um, and the family as well. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with Pastor Jake as he's uh, preaching, give him the words to speak and us the ears to listen. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning. Uh, as you may, may have noticed, I sent a message late yesterday. Maybe some of you were sleeping already uh, about the sliding day there's also an insert in your bulletins um, so the reason for kind of the earliness in planning this thing with restrictions they're kind of limited to the number of slots that they have available as far as bookings and stuff go we can't just do group bookings when we want so I would would have made this a lot easier but uh, it is what it is and so the way it works is they're they're opening tomorrow morning at nine o'clock in the morning slots will open for the 21st so monday february 21st from 2 to 5 45 p.m uh, in mcgregor is when we're going to go sledding so you can book online uh, so just go to tubinghill.ca and find the 21st and the time slot there and book in however many people are wanting to attend as far as sliders go so it is 12 dollars per person um, if there's a concern about anything like that, there's talk about the church reimbursing that as well. So we will kind of figure that out here. So this is kind of last minute planning, but uh, we had to get ahead of this thing because I think the slots are going to go quickly. So if you do want to come, talk to myself uh, and uh, I'll help you out with that. Uh, but please go online tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and uh, book a slot for your family if you want to go. If you have any questions, my phone number is at the bottom there. Uh, give me a call and uh, or text message and we'll figure it out. But yeah, looking forward to that and hope to see you, as many as you there as we can. Thank you.
breaking a rule to say your name out loud in school when your name's the only one that sets us free when did it become incorrect to speak the truth about life and death when your life gave us all eternity even if it gets me convicted i'll be on my knees with my hands lifted if serving you's a cancel of man if living on my faith in you is banned then i'll stand like to be tired and only a shell of yourself do you start to believe you don't have what it takes cause it's all you can do just move on much less finish the race but don't forget what life ahead Almost home Brother, it won't be long Soon all your burdens will be gone With all your strength Sister, run wild on faith Hold up your head Keep pressing 
this road will be hard but we win in the end simply because of jesus in us it's not if but when so take joy in the journey even when it feels long oh find strength in each step knowing heaven is cheering you morning. Today's scripture I've chosen to read from Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful winter morning. Thank you for all those who can make it here, and I pray you be with those who couldn't. Thank you, Lord, for your never-ending love through your son, Jesus, and that nothing here on earth can separate us from you. Pray that you be with Pastor Jake as he delivers your word to us. Help him to have the words to speak, and us as the congregation, ears to listen. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jason, for that reading and uh, sticking around for the second service. Thank you for sharing some music with us. Uh, the group was called Written and Read, as it said in your bulletin. Uh, thank you for coming and, uh, and doing that for us. <clears throat> this morning, I want to continue in uh, the book of Acts. Uh, we've been, uh, we've been kind of going through the book of Acts, uh, at least when I when I, uh, as long as uh, the schedule, we had to break for Christmas, we had to break for this and for that as we went through, but uh, I think it's been a year and a half that we've been in the book of Acts now already, 
But we are up to chapter, I will be reading from chapter 25 and 26 today. And uh, what we're going to see today, uh, just to summarize a bit, is we'll see that Paul continues to preach the gospel faithfully and without fear. And he fulfills God's call on his life to proclaim his name, God's name, to the Gentiles and to kings. And we will see that his biography is being written not so much by the events that are unfolding, but by the direction of the Lord, as the Lord determines what will happen. Um, let us pray before we continue. Lord, this morning we pray that you grant us the faith to believe you and your word and to trust you fully for all that you have revealed to us in your holy word. May we be enlightened and may we be encouraged today. Bless our time together this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we've been going through the book of Acts, I'm sure you've all noticed these things as well, but what we've seen here is, is the Lord's words are being fulfilled as we, as we see Paul's, uh, Paul's work, his missionary journeys. Uh, back in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. And so we've been seeing the fulfillment of these words of God to Ananias. Uh, now, just to clarify, this is a different Ananias than what we read about last Sunday. Ananias was also a high priest that was not, uh, he was not a nice man. Uh, this Ananias was uh, a believer uh, that was there when Paul was converted uh, in Damascus. Uh, so different Ananias. Uh, but ever since then, Paul has been testifying to the Gentiles. Uh, we, we recall the missionary journeys, uh, first, second, and third missionary journeys, and I, I wish I had looked it up uh, before this message as to how many years in total it would have been, but his third missionary journey alone was probably over two years. And so... Uh, he's been a number of years on different missionary journeys, and he's been speaking to Gentiles. He's been preaching the gospel to Gentiles. And over the last couple of chapters, uh, we've seen how he's preached the gospel to Roman kings and to governors in the Roman provinces. Uh, the very first Gentile ruler that Paul met and witnessed to was the proconsul at Paphos in Cyprus on his first missionary journey way back in Acts chapter 13. And when Paul preached the gospel to him, this proconsul came to Christ and believed. And in chapter 24, where we're going to be looking at today, uh, Paul is testifying before the governor, Felix. And after he's testified, Paul actually leaves him here in prison for two years. And then he also appears in front of uh, Festus, who is the one who succeeds uh, uh, Felix's term as governor. Uh, and so we will see that these trials are not about Paul, per se, but they are about the message that he preached. They are about Jesus Christ. And so I want to, I wanna, uh, I'm not purposely trying to skip chapter 24, but I didn't want to read all of it, but I will uh, kind of tell the story a little bit uh, in, in short form. Um, we, uh, last, last Sunday, we ended up with the, uh, the Roman guards and the soldiers giving uh, Paul uh, escort to Caesarea, and he was put into uh, uh, the barracks there at Herod's Praetorium uh, so that he would uh, be able to appear before Felix. And so at the beginning of chapter 24, uh, the uh, Ananias, this is now the, the high priest from, uh, from Jerusalem, uh, together with some elders and, a, and a, an attorney called Tertullus, uh, Tertullus, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it, they, they came with a, with a lawyer to, to argue for them. And, uh, and so they, Paul appeared in front of the council and the, uh, uh, the lawyer starts to speak and, and he says in verse 5 here, We found this man a real pest and a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And in verse 6, And he even tried to desecrate the temple. He's throwing all these accusations out in front of the governor, Felix, uh, trying to make it look really bad. Uh, Paul is just such a scoundrel here. Uh, but, uh, and then he continues and he talks about the, how the commander came along and, and took him out of their hands. And, 
and then they uh, uh, came here to, uh, to appear before Felix. And verse 9 says, the other Jews that, that had come with him, they, they joined in the verbal attack, and they said, yeah, this is what happened, these things are so. But then Paul is able to respond, and he, he gives his defense here in verses uh, uh, 10 down through, uh, down through about 21. Uh, there's, he gives his defense, but he, he also, he first of all, you know, he says, he, he addresses all of these charges that have been thrown at him by, by the lawyer here, but then he also gives testimony in verse 14 and 15. I admit to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men cherish themselves though there shall certainly be a that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the and the wicked and then he says that in in view of that he I've also done my best he says uh, to maintain a blameless conscience before God and men and then he had come to Jerusalem verse 17 came to Jerusalem and he had brought some alms from uh, uh, from the other nations, where, from his missionary trips, where people had contributed money to send to Jerusalem to the to the ones that were poor there, and uh, it says they found him pure, uh, found him occupied in the temple, having been purified uh, without any crowd or uproar. But then there were some Jews from Asia that caused an uproar, and 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 then he mentions, by the way, these Jew, those Jews that that. Uh, said I caused the out or that actually caused the outroar. They should have been the ones coming here to uh, bring the accusation before uh, this uh, governor Felix. But anyway, he uh, uh, Felix has a little bit more thorough understanding exactly of what Paul is teaching, uh, the knowledge about the way it says here, uh, and he puts these accusers off. He doesn't. He reserves judgment. He says, "I'm going to wait." for the commander to come down, and one day when he comes through here, then I will decide your case. And so he, he gives orders for Paul to be held in prison, uh, though somewhat loosely. It says he was, uh, he was to be held, uh, and yet have some freedom, and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. His friends could still come to see him, spend time with him, uh, see to his needs, and so on. Um, but then in verse 24 to the end of chapter 24, uh, 24 to 27 in, in chapter 24, uh, Felix and his wife Drusilla, uh, she was a Jewess, they, it, it tells us that they came numerous times or they called Paul to come and, and speak to them. A and what does Paul do? Paul again shares his faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 24, uh, sent, they sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in, in Christ Jesus. But then in verse 25, it says, But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. Paul's talking about judgment, self-control, and righteousness. Felix was not living a good life, a very immoral life. His wife, Drusilla, he had actually stolen her from another man she had been previously married and so he's living in an immoral lifestyle and so when Paul starts to talk about righteousness and self-control and the judgment Felix says oh whoa 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 I don't want to hear any more of that so let's stop there uh, at the same time Felix was calling him and he had conversations with him obviously uh, he was hoping that Paul and his entourage his friends would maybe give him some money so that he could would be set free and so he kept uh, talking to him uh, conversing with him uh, but it says after two years had passed so he, he's been there now with two years so I don't know how many times Felix and his wife had called for him and, and spoken with him but what Paul did was share his faith in Christ Jesus and then Festus took over Festus was the next governor and uh, uh, Felix left Paul in prison and so all of a sudden this this transition in power happens in the government and uh, uh, Felix had left him there and, and maybe maybe kind of forgotten about him put him left him in prison and kind of left him there now Festus was governor and Festus in the beginning of chapter 25 we see that he travels down to Jerusalem I'm assuming when he takes power, he probably wanted to do a little bit of traveling around to touch base with his constituents, and he's traveled to Jerusalem, and there uh, the Jews come to him and they pressure him. 
let's, let's do something with Paul. We need to make sure Paul, uh, you know, we want Paul to come back to Jerusalem to stand trial. And, uh, and so he says, well, when I go back home, uh, send your influential men back with me as well, and I'll, I'll convene court again. I'll call the tribunal, and we'll, we'll make him appear again, and we'll see, we'll see what's, what's, what's happened. And uh, uh, obviously Festus at this time, he's, he's been, he, must have, he can't have been new to government. He would have been around when Felix was, was conducting the first trial, and so he would have been aware of Paul's uh, trial and, and, and uh, Paul's uh, teaching as well and, and his faith. Uh, so he's, he's not unaware of what's going on, but he, uh, he, he says, yeah, okay, to the Jews, come on up and we'll, we'll have another trial. And uh, uh, Festus is kind of wanting to please the Jews, and he's, so he asks Paul, are you willing to go back to Jerusalem to stand trial there? And Paul knows that he won't get a fair trial with, with the Jews in Jerusalem. And so he says, I am standing here before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you all also very well know. This is now chapter 25, verse 10, where I'm reading. Um, and so um, Festus takes all of this into account and discusses it with his counsel or his advisors. And he says, you've, you've, uh, you've asked to go to Caesar, and so to Caesar you will go. Uh, he, he doesn't make judgment. He says, you, you will go to Rome to see uh, Caesar, the emperor. And so from verse 13 is where I want to start reading this morning. Um, last Sunday I, I mentioned, and I think I focused a fair bit on uh, what it says in chapter 23, verse 11, where it says, Take courage, for you have, found, you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, and you must also witness at Rome. Uh, God gave Paul the assurance that he would be able to appear before Rome. And so I referred to that a number of times as that, that confidence that Paul had that nothing would happen to him until he had gotten to Rome. And uh, um, so we've seen Paul sharing the gospel with the rulers. Um, Felix here was, was obviously hoping for a bribe, uh, but... Uh, uh, Knowing, you know, when Felix would, would call Paul for conversation, knowing who Paul was, we know that those conversations would always have covered matters of faith. And so Felix will have been learning from him, and Festus too, obviously, will have had the chance to know about the way, uh, which is what they called it, the gospel, uh, from the initial trial that he had. And uh, so now in uh, verse 13, King Agrippa and Bernice are here visiting Festus. And again, they will be hearing the testimony of Paul and the message of the gospel. And it won't stop here either, because eventually Paul will be seeing the king, the emperor of Rome, because he has appealed to Caesar. Uh, just as the God had said, Paul would be his chosen instrument to proclaim his name to the Gentiles and their kings. Way back from chapter 9, verse 15, Paul was God's chosen instrument to proclaim God's name to the Gentiles and to their kings. And so we see the fulfillment of God's will in his life. And I think in that same way also, when we obey the Lord and when we do his work, we are also fulfilling God's will for our lives as well. Let's start reading Acts chapter 25, verse 13. Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. While they were spending many days there, Fest Paul's case before the king and said, There is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix, and when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense <coughs> against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. 
But when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So here Festus has a visiting dignitary, King Agrippa II, and his sister Bernice. They've come to visit. Uh, he was the governor of the region north of Judea. Now Agrippa II was the great-grandson of King Herod the Great. King Herod the Great, who was ruler at the time when Jesus was born. Uh, Agrip Agrippa II, the one that was visiting here, he, his father's name was also Agrippa. He's known as Agrippa I, one who persecuted the church in Acts chapter 12 when the apostle James was killed. And so now Agrippa II, he was the last one in that family chain from the Herod dynasty that was ruling. Uh, and Bernice was his sister, but he had taken Bernice as his wife. And so they, there was an incestuous relationship happening here with Agrippa and Bernice. Um, and so also not, not a good man, not, not a believer, um, not, a, not a moral man at all. Uh, Paul had uh, appealed to Caesar here, and he would end up standing trial in Rome. But in order for them to send someone to Rome, they had to send some kind of paperwork or some kind of charge. And so Festus was having a hard time writing, figuring out what to write down for a charge. Because the truth was that Paul had done nothing wrong against the Jewish law, not against the temple, or even against Caesar. But they had to create some kind of a charge before they could send him to Rome. And so since Agrippa and Bernice were here, Festus invited them to help him. Let's read from verse 23. So on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice, Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not to live in any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my lord. Therefore I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me to send a prisoner and not to indicate also the charges against him. So let's just imagine this scene for a moment here. Uh, we have the, the grandeur of the Roman ceremonial splendor. Uh, we have the presence of the governor Festus. Uh, the King Agrippa is there as guests and Bernice and all the important dignitaries, all the high-ranking officers, all the leading men of the city, they're gathered together. Uh, it, it would be, for, for a simple example, it could possibly be for compared to, comparable to if we would be given the opportunity to appear in our parliament in Ottawa, in front of all the cabinet ministers, all the MPs, in front of all the highest echelons of government, you have on one side here in this story, you have the Roman elite representing the power of Rome. And on the other hand, you have this humble man of the way representing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What an honor Paul had. Paul was given a chance to explain himself. But more importantly, he was given a chance to share his faith, the message of the risen Christ. This is something that Paul could have never arranged if he had planned for it, but it was God who provided it. The gospel will reach the Gentiles and their kings, just as the Lord has said. This is, this is what the grace of God is, and it extends to all people, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the educated, the uneducated, and everyone is within reach of God's grace. Because the gospel was not meant only for the Jews, but it was meant also for the Gentiles, for the Romans, and for the kings and the rulers. But this opportunity could not have been made possible without the timely visit of Agrippa and Bernice. And it was God who brought this all about. God made it possible for these Roman elite to hear the gospel. 
And we see here, uh, chapter 26, uh, we see Paul giving the longest testimony uh, that we read in the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 26, starting at verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, from which, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God day and night. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? going to pause there just briefly. Uh, the Jewish law or Judaism, all throughout the Jewish law, it points to Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And now Jesus had come and he had fulfilled the law and he had been crucified, but he had been raised to life again. That is exactly what Jewish law taught all the way throughout. And so he says here, this is exactly the hope that our fathers are, are hoping to attain. This is the promise that we've been given. This is what's happened. And now, why is it so difficult for us to believe that God raises the dead? Verse 9. So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And I became furiously enraged at them. I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, as I was journeying, journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me, in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Here is the message of the gospel that Paul carries as a servant and a witness to open our eyes, to turn from darkness to light, to free from the bondage of Satan, to grant us forgiveness of sin and an eternal home among the sanctified. Now this is obviously the experience of each one of us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ. We've turned our eyes from darkness We've seen the light. We've been freed from the bondage of Satan. We've been given forgiveness of sin. And we have an eternal home with our Father in heaven. Verse 19. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing 
but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So nothing that Paul had done or had been doing to this point was from himself or for himself. He says in verse 19, I was not disobedient to that vision from heaven when God spoke to him. And I, he says also, I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. Verse 24, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, are you out of your mind? Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. To someone with a closed mind, the message of, of the gospel is absolutely insane. But to a mind that has opened to God, that message is true and it is reasonable. And are we willing to believe what God has revealed? Verse 28, Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Here we see the true heart of an evangelist. He says, whether it's a short time or a long time, it does not matter. My only hope is that you will become believers of Jesus Christ, just like me. I hope that you and all of you who are listening to me today, he says, may become believers of Christ Jesus. All just like I am, except for the chains that I'm wearing, he says. There's a song in our hymnal, number 437, it says, Almost Persuaded. And that, is, that song is actually written on, based on this story here, where King Agrippa says, Almost you have persuaded me to become a Christian. The song goes on to say, Almost is not enough. If you have not made that decision to follow Christ, don't keep saying, I'm almost there. We don't know when it'll be too late. Make that decision when you can. Agrippa did not make that decision at this point, but he was almost persuaded. Verse 30, it says, The king stood up, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And so with that, the royalty has left the room convinced of Paul's innocence. An interesting note here, of all the, uh, the Herods, uh, or the, the descendants of Herod that have ruled, in, in Scripture, this is the only positive statement that we see in the Scripture from the Herod dynasty regarding the Christian faith. And that came from this last Herod king, when he says, I am almost persuaded to believe. Unfortunately, it does not tell us whether he ever did later on. But Paul did what he could, faithfully and without any fear. He fulfilled the Lord's will in proclaiming his name to the Gentiles and to their kings. And it, would not, it will not end here. He will be transferred to Rome uh, because the Lord said back in chapter 23, verse 11, you've testified for me here in Jerusalem, you must also testify for me in Rome. The Lord determined that. We see Paul's biography or Paul's story being written not so much as by the events that are unfolding, but as the Lord determines. All of these things, Paul could have never arranged them, themselves, arranged them himself. The Lord orchestrated these things. God chose him 
when he was persecuting the believers and commissioned him, God prepared him and protected him. In these last few chapters, we've seen numerous times where God has protected him. And God enabled him to testify to the Roman kings, and eventually he will also testify in Rome. Our own stories, our own life stories, our own biographies are not being written either as we speak. Our human point of view, maybe we could write our story as to what, what our, our life has been like. But really, our biography, our life story is written by our God, who knows all things and determines all things and looks from his perspective. And he guides us in his path. And so for us on this side of heaven, we continue to seek him and we continue to follow him. If you are working in any kind of a ministry, whether it's within the church or whether it's in your community or whether it's in, in your workplace, whatever kind of ministry that you are serving in, I'm sure you would all agree that you have been prepared for where you, the situation you're in. When I think about myself here, I, I know that God wants me to serve in this ministry. And he prepared me by placing me in a Christian family. And I grew up in a Christian home uh, with a minister for a father and uh, attending a Christian uh, private school where the word of God was just ingrained into everything that was said or done at all times. And, uh, and so that was part of my preparation. I think for each of you, you would all admit that there's been some kind of a th things that have happened in your life where God has actually orchestrated things to prepare you for what you're needing to do later on. You would never may have expected to be doing. Because our biography is not being written as we speak. Our biography is being written from the perspective of our Savior and Father, God. God knows everything and he directs our paths. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. We submit ourselves to him in all our ways, and he will direct our paths. We consult him, and we let him guide us. We want to live our lives according to his will, because we know that that is the best for us. And so we trust him. Paul would continue on to Rome and he will continue to proclaim the gospel by the divine will of God. And so we see the kingdom of God cannot be stopped. Earthly kings and kingdoms, they will come and go. And that included the Roman Empire of the time that we're reading about in, in Scripture. But the kingdom of God remains. All of us are here today. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached from generation to generation and from place to place. The kingdom of God cannot be stopped and the message of the gospel will continue to be preached. And we are proof of that today. And so remember, brothers and sisters, that we are commissioned by the Lord to do exactly that. To do the same thing, to proclaim the gospel and to make disciples. And so our challenge today is to testify for Christ. Paul testified in Jerusalem and God told him, you will also testify for me in Rome. So wherever we appear, should we ever get that chance to appear in Parliament and be able to present our faith story to the MPs in the cabinet, may we be empowered to do that. His kingdom will continue to rule and reign through our witness and testimony today until the Lord returns. So what are we doing for the kingdom of God today? In what ways are we fulfilling his will and contributing to the cause of Christ? I'm sure all of us want to be able to say what Paul said at the end of his life. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. May we all be found to be his good and faithful servants. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord.
for your word, for this account of Paul and how he was faithful and willing to testify at all points, at all times. Thank you for his obedience to you and how that has brought about so many blessings to the people then and to us today as well. As your word has been preached faithfully throughout the generations, Father, thank you for each one that was involved in the generations past. May we be those generations going forward as well, as well that would continue to testify of you and of your word. May we continue to preach and to live this gospel today and every day going forward. Help us to stay faithful and committed to it until the day that we will see you again. We pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. For a closing number this morning, let's turn to uh, page six. This is my father's world, number six. There we go. My fault. Um, I want to leave you with a benediction that we find in Numbers where it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Once again, thank you all for coming and God bless you.